Uh, last night I was just driving somewhere and I turned on Radio 2000 and I heard the word entrepreneur. And then I just decided, no, let me hear what they're talking about. And then, well, I decided, no, let me definitely give them a call and find out where and where all of this is happening. What I find is the hookup dinner brings relevant people that do help entrepreneurs to grow and expand their businesses. She was telling us how to access um, companies that would help us with uh, developing and growing our businesses and different ways on how to do that. We've got a lovely lady who's a great friend of ours, great advisor, and she offers so much. And that's why we wanted to open the Hookup Dinner 2014 with this topic, because a lot of entrepreneurs hear this buzzword, enterprise development. We hear it being thrown around in the media. When we hear BEE, we just shut off because we think it's this foreign concept. And it frustrates both black and white entrepreneurs because it seems like this thing that is just there and you almost can't reach it, but it's, it's here. But you are, we don't understand it and therefore we just give up and we continue on our own path. But when I looked at it, when I looked at the topic, it was how can we use this as a business tool? How can we use this to make our startups to move forward? And we decided let's invite an expert. Let's invite somebody that deals with this thing on a daily basis and travels the rest of South Africa and the continent talking about transformation. And that's why we've got Olga tonight. All right, good evening. How are we all doing? Okay, first of all, I can talk about this particular topic. I can just talk generally for days. Um, but I can talk on this particular topic for absolute hours. They've only given me 30 minutes. So as a precursor, as a disclaimer, by the time that you leave here, you're not going to know everything. Um, I'm sure either one of the third member teams is going to explain the partnership that Transcend Corporate Advisors, um, whom I'm representing here, is going to be entering into together with THUD to break it down in more tangible, more real, more practical terms in terms of how you can make the various opportunities that um, now exist in terms of BE legislation available to you. Today really is just an introduction. Um, so that they don't ring the bell on me, I'm going to ask that if you've got any questions, if you could please, please just keep them till the end. Unless there's something that's totally confusing and you don't understand what I'm saying, we don't want to get to the promised land of understanding and you're still staying in the wilderness. So if it's a burning question, you're welcome to ask it. Otherwise, I'm more than happy to entertain any questions at the end. All right. Um, so they told me, Olga, come and chat about ED. Um, I was going to tell you that it seems to be the latest buzzword, and indeed it is, uh, as you heard Lebu said. And their topic is using enterprise development spend as a business tool. And I sort of disagree. I sort of disagree with that topic. But anyway, I'll tell you why, that the focus should not only be on ED spend. Now, before I start, we need to understand some language together so that when I use these terms, you know exactly what I'm talking about. First of all, in what space does enterprise development or ED exist? All right, it exists in transformation, excuse me, it exists in BE legislation. But there is a difference between BE, ladies and gents, and triple BE, okay? For those of us that may not know, BE, Black Economic Empowerment, is what governments and those outside of government prior to 2007 were about. It was about the few rich people. If you were in the right place at the right time, you had the right color, you got rich very quickly. Government steps in on about 2007 and says, nay, man, we come from a history where certain categories of people were not privy to opportunities to participate on the economic playing field. And so it is not good enough if you've got the right surname, if you know the right political party, if you're in the right place at the right time. For those people only to get rich, we want the broader majority, everybody who is a citizen of South Africa, to have opportunities to be able to tap in into the awesome resources and opportunities that exist. So government says it's not BE anymore. It is triple BE, which is broad-based black economic empowerment. So that's the context within which we exist. But ladies and gents, there's a bigger conversation, and that conversation, you will hear me talk about it often, is called transformation. Transformation is irrespective of the color that you are. Black, white, Indian, colored, Chinese, it's summer. So for some of us, it also means spray tan orange because you need to go to the beach and you don't want to scare people away. It doesn't matter what color of the skin that you are. Transformation is about all of us. It's about South Africans making the opportunities that exist in our country a reality. Okay, so transformation is only, excuse me, transformation is a bigger picture. BE is a small aspect of transformation. How are we going to tap into and make South Africa a better place? Next, uh, black. 
All right, so when we are talking about black people, who are we talking about? Is it a case of now that everybody who is not black, everybody who's not permanently tanned, thank you very much, you participated in the pictures, see you at the door, this is irrelevant to you. No. Okay? It is black economic empowerment, but as you, we go through the presentation now, you will see that there is a role for absolutely every single one of us to play. And ladies and gents, why I'm going to emphasize this? Because we're talking about transformation. We're talking about this beautiful country of our South Africa and how we can make it work. Black defined, ladies and gents, is African. Okay, we're all Africans, but they say that people like me are Africans. Africans, coloreds, Indians, and Chinese. Where do the Chinese fit in? Well, Chinese, ladies and gents, fall within the definition of colored. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so when BE first came into the picture, remembering that BE is about making opportunities that previously did not avail themselves because of apartheid laws, making those people who weren't able to benefit on the economic playing field in owning assets of this country and managing assets of this country to do so. So the Chinese Association of South Africa goes to court and they say, listen, um, we weren't allowed to participate, so we also want to participate. Government agrees and says, okay, sharp. Chinese, you are black, but only black for purposes of BEE. And ladies and gents, it is not all black people, excuse me, it's not all Chinese people, but only second generation Chinese. So when we talk black throughout this conversation, don't forget it's African, it's colored, and it is Indians. Now what about our brothers and sisters who come from the borders and they've now become South Africans by way of naturalization? You are black if you became a South African citizen before the 27th of April 1994. If you became a South African citizen on the 27th of April 1994 or after the 27th of April 1994, ach shame, you are not black. All right? So, black before the 27th of April 1994, but we love you nonetheless and you'll see that it doesn't matter when or how you became black or are not black. Um, this is still important to us. Ladies and gents, again, it's about transformation. BE is only one tool within which to make transformation work. I just want to theoretically say something in relation to this ID book. Do you know, I'm sure you do, but especially with the new ID books, it is not possible to determine a person's race from their ID. Okay? So what's going to be interesting in the next couple of years is when people say, actually, I'm tired of this black thing. I'm not black, I'm white. Who are you going to argue with? Or if somebody comes and says, actually, I want to try this black thing, I now decide that I am black. I spend five hours a day in the sun already um, wanting to permanently tan my skin, so I am black. Now, it's going to be interesting. So if, for example, those that can see this picture, dear Mr. He looks like Mr. Fenter, but um, it's Togo Promise. If he decides it's who he wants to be, then that is exactly what they're going to say. All right, so we've determined who is black. You're going to hear me talk about EMEs. You're going to hear me talk about QECs, and you're going to hear me talk about generics. EMEs, ladies and gents, are those companies who fall underneath the threshold of having an annual turnover of 10 million rand a year. If your business has got an annual turnover of less than 10 million rand, you are a EME. If your business has got an annual turnover between 10 million and 50 million, you are a QSC. And if it is greater than 50 million, you are a generic. It is very important that we understand that. And I'm sure, I'm assuming, that at least now, there's a lot of us that are EMEs and QSCs, but we're aspiring to be generic, so awesomeness. And then there's a concept called SD, which is supply development. I'll explain a little bit more about there, which is a new concept and an even more exciting concept, frankly, than ED. SD, ladies and gents, is where you want to be, not necessarily only on ED. Okay, transformation, I spoke about it. Let's go to the next slide, please. This is a graph that was published a couple of years ago. And what it does on the y-axis, x-axis, don't know, maths, long time ago, um, whatever axis this is, it's life expectancy of a particular grouping of people in a nation per years as against the average income that they earn per annum. Okay, so the thinking is the more you earn, the longer your lifespan because you're able to get access to education, able to get access to health, whatever the case may be. All right, so if we, for example, look at the bottom, our friends across the border, Zimbabwe, Zambia, they say to have a national income per person of around nothing or $1,000 a year, and their life expectancy is just over 40 years. If we look right at the top, our friends in Japan, with a life expectancy of just under 90, ladies and gents, they have got an average income per person of 30,000. Where is South Africa? South Africa's here. You'll agree with me, ladies and gents, that we are out of the curve. Now, we are said, on average, to have a national income per person of about 12,000 per annum. 
but our life expectancy is just over 50. If we were part of this graph, with an average national income per person of about 12, 10, 12,000, where should we be? We should be with our Chilean friends over there with a life expectancy of just under 90. Alternatively, if we're going to look as to what they say that our general life expectancy is of just over 50, where should our national income be with our Tanzanian friends on pretty much nothing? South Africa has got what is called the highest Gini coefficient in the world. Gini coefficient, ladies and gents, is a statistical measure of the gap between those who have and who do not have. We have got the broadest gap. With a percentage of about 7.9 out of 10, we have got the biggest gap between the rich and the poor. In other words, the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer. So that is how we can stay at a place where we are outside of the grass. So transformation has to be about reducing that inequality. I don't know about you, but last night watching ENCA, I couldn't watch the entire news. I got sick, I turned off the television. Why? More and more and more protests. And those protests are becoming what? More and more violent. People are dying, people are burning things, people are frustrated, absolutely frustrated. I mean, one doesn't need to drive far. Go to Santon, beautiful. High-rising buildings, you've got your Jimmy Choo's, your Pradas, wonderful. Hop into the car, a couple of kilometers over the highway, what do you hit? Alexandra. A good friend of mine, one of the stories that she tells me, sad, she's a doctor. She says, oh, you know what, it's sad when you have to treat a baby at a clinic who's got bite marks on their face. Bite marks, you may ask? Well, um, in Alexandria, there are rats, okay? And those rats get hot. They're hot as well. So they go into the houses or into the shacks or into the living quarters, wherever they may be, in order to get some shelter. Not only do they need shelter, but they need some moisture. Ladies and gents, where do they find the moisture? On the drooling faces of babies. That is the South Africa that we currently live in. Does that have to be the South Africa that we're in? Absolutely not. Last year, The Economist, which is a business magazine, for those of us that may not be familiar with it, said that Africa is the continent of hope. I was like, thank you. It took you so long because they've been saying that Africa is a continent of hopelessness for so long. This is where we have got to be. There's no better place in this world at this time to be in than in Africa. And where better a place than South Africa to start the entry and make this awesome continent the place that it can be. So, ladies and gents, it's about transformation. BE is one aspect of transformation. Transformation, transformation, transformation. So, it's about making sure that we are able to reduce the gap between those who don't have and those who have. All right, next slide, two. Transformation, we're going to go down the stairs. So, I'm relying on my sidekick here. We're a good team, black and white, that's how it's supposed to be. All right, cool. Okay, now, I'm sure you'll agree with me that the world that we live in, the South Africa that we live in in 2007 is a different South Africa to the world and is a different South Africa to the one that we live in today. Okay, South Africa 2007 had its challenges. We have our challenges today. Now, government has since then been struggling to promulgate legislation policies that help to meet the growing challenges that we have. Hands up, what are some of the challenges that you think that we as South Africans have, and particularly those of us that are sitting in the room here? What are challenges that face us? Yes, sir. Quality of education. What, why do you say that? We got a matric pass rate of 82%. Yes, 30%. Okay, yes, sir. Corruption. All right, it's rife, ma'am. Funding for education. Okay, nice first is not paying out. All right, last two. Job creation. Okay, we go to school, we study, and then we can't find jobs. Yes, sir. Infrastructure, it's a challenge. Can I just quickly go back to job creation? Unemployment, ladies and gents, towards the end of last year, we all got excited. Why? Because South Africa's official unemployment rate went from 25.2% to down to 24.7%. Whoopie do. What is the unofficial unemployment rate in this country? Sitting around 40, not even 30, sitting around 40. And can I ask you, out of that 40% unofficial rate, how many of that comprises young people? 70%. 70%. So ladies and gents, when I get challenged as to this fact, you know, Olga, BE, it's reverse racism, and you want to take us back to those things, there's no hope for my young white son. I may as well just immigrate. I'm like, okay, so excuse me. 
with an unofficial unemployment rate of 70%, surely the question cannot be, is there a hope of a job for my young white son? But is there a hope for a job of any South African? And ladies and gents, that is where we come into the picture. That is where you come into the picture. Government has recognized through the National Development Plan, which is one of its recent policies, saying that these are some of the challenges that we have. And government is placing a particular emphasis on them. First one, too few people work. Unemployment, job creation, poor education. We heard that. Infrastructure, we heard that it's under-maintained and insufficient. Special patterns drive inequality. Our economy is overly resource-intensive. We have a failing public health system. There's corruption, poor public services, and to a large degree, we remain a divided society. Unfortunately, we were very united during the World Cup, but when Philip left, so did our unity. Um, now, whose problem is it? Surely it's not ours. What can we do, right? We're struggling with our businesses. Today we have business. Tomorrow we don't. Some of us are struggling. Even in the workplace, we've got to provide for our families back at home. So whose problem is it anyway? Ladies and gents, it is every single one of our problems. Yes, government has got a role to play, and they better play their role. Yes, corporates, big corporates have got their role to play, and they better play the role. But ladies and gents, can I tell you, we have also got a role to play, irrespective of what we think we may have or may not have. A couple of years ago, I was very blessed to sit in on a presentation that was given by US First Lady Michelle Obama. And she said, you don't have to be a Nelson Mandela, a Desmond Tutu, a Walter Susulu in order to make a difference. All you need to do is exercise influence in the small circle that you have. That's all you got to do. So ladies and gents, as small in businesses as you may think you are, as entrepreneurs that are still struggling, or may not even be struggling, now you've been shooting for the moon and now you're landing on the stars, you're doing awesome. Government needs you. South Africa needs you. The South African economy needs you. And you will see as we start to go through the slides now why they say that they need you and why there is such a great emphasis on it. This is the current world of BE that we live in. Okay, there are seven pillars. Ownership, management, control, employment, equity, skills development, preferential procurement, enterprise development, there's your buzzword, as well as socioeconomic development. So government is saying that they want to see companies contribute to the transformation of this country by looking at this, those seven pillars and using the criteria that are set out in the BE codes, making sure that companies get their points. All right? Enterprise development, ladies and gents, 15 points. Preferential procurement, which is the measure by companies as to how much they spend when they purchase goods and services from companies that are properly empowered. Okay, companies that are properly empowered. Let me pause there. Do you know that BE is law, but it's not law? Yes, okay. So it's law, but nobody's forced to do it. You don't have to do BE if you don't want to. Companies don't have to give you ED money if they don't want to. It is a social contract between organizations to say, we recognize that tr um, transformation is important. And so by showing us what level you are in your certificate, you are saying that you are contributing to the journey of transformation. If you are a level eight, it means mm, you're not doing that great a job. If you're a level two, it means that you're doing an awesome job from a BE perspective. Okay, so it's law, but it's not law in the sense that if you don't do it, you're not gonna go to prison, you're not gonna go to jail which is something that's important to recognize. Why? Because it informs our attitude as to our approach to organizations. This, ladies and gents, is going to be the world that we live in come the 11th of October 2014. BE laws have changed, and they are compulsory with regards to the application from the 11th of October 2014. We've gone from seven pillars all the way down to five. Ownership still stays. Management control is still there. Skills development is there. Enterprise and supply development is a new concept. Socioeconomic development is there. Ladies and gents, enterprise and supply development, you'll agree with me, out of 40 points, is the biggest pillar on the scorecard. So for businesses, for organizations, for companies, this carries the most weight. And it is inside here that enterprise development plays a role. It is inside here that supply development plays a role. I told you that supply development is even more important than enterprise development, and we'll touch on that now as to why. It is also in here that we find preferential procurement. I've just defined it. It is getting, um, it is how companies are measured with regards to are they spending their money, are they giving businesses to the right companies, to the right entities. 
Not only have we gone from seven pillars down to five, but ladies and gents, there has been the introduction of what is called a priority pillar. There are three priority pillars now. One of them, enterprise and supply development. What does that mean? It means that of the particular targets that are there, companies have got a 40% minimum threshold that they have to comply with. If they don't meet that 40% minimum threshold, ladies and gents, they get penalized. Okay, so companies are now freaking out because many of them have got tenders, they've got contracts in which they promise that they will be a particular level. But not only are they, is it now harder for them to get those points, they've got to get those points, they've got to get those points with the right people, and now there's a 40% minimum threshold that never existed. And if they don't meet that, they get penalized, something that they can't necessarily afford to do. So let's delve into the detail. Enterprise development and supply development. Is it about a check? You just get the money? You just get the loan? All right, or is it about something more? Ladies and gents, enterprise and supply development, broadly defined, are this. It is any initiative that a business does with another business, another qualifying business, to assist it in its operational abilities, its operational capacity, as well as also its financial capacity. It can involve the writing of a check, but ladies and gents, it is so much more. So when you start to think as to, all right, who am I going to approach for purposes of enterprise development? You need to ask yourself the question, what do I need financially? And don't just think rands and dollars. Think, for example, you go to the bank. Bank wants security. Can you afford that security? No. If you go to an organization and say, please, will you stand in as security for me? Give me a surety. Give me a guarantee. That qualifies for enterprise development. You're not taking the risk. You're getting a loan from the bank. Yay. Let another business take the risk. That's enterprise development, as is also supply development. It's more about the money. Let's say, for example, you don't have an office. Okay, you've been working in your car, but now you're growing and you need an office. If a business and organization allows you office space on their premises, either for free or at a reduced rent, ladies and gents, that qualifies as enterprise development. You need capital. You need goods. You need furniture. You need equipment. It's more than just the money. It is about opportunities. And so at the beginning, you heard me say that I sort of differ a little bit with what the organizers have put with regards to a topic. It's right, but it's so much more. Enterprise development should not only be seen as to how can I get money, how can I get spend for business growth, it's how can I get opportunities for business growth. Now, the difference between enterprise development and supply development, there is a push, you'll see it just now, for companies to give business to small companies. I'm sure you'll agree with me that it is one thing to be supported in terms of an office, to be supported in terms of a loan or a grant, whatever the case may be, but then they give you a 100,000 rand and they walk away. You still need a market for your goods, am I right? So now government is saying, okay guys, we actually want you to be bringing these businesses into your supply chains. It's not just good enough to be sponsoring them anymore. You have got to bring them into your supply chain. And as soon as they bring you into your supply chain and they continue to develop you, you become a supplier development beneficiary. The benefit of that, you've got everything that everybody in the ED space has, plus you are guaranteed business from the particular company that is sponsoring you. And that is why I say that enterprise development is worth more than supply development. So if you are in the supply chain of a particular organization and they develop you, it is supply development. If you are outside of the supply chain of a particular organization and they develop you, it is enterprise development. Does that mean that you must choose which one you want to be a part of? No. Go for where there's opportunities. But then encourage in your conversations, if you're only doing enterprise development, in your conversations with your donor, see how you can get into the um, supply chain. And you'll see on the scorecard that you've got ammunition even when you have those conversations. Why? Because it helps them to get higher points from a BE perspective. So the money's out there. But now, ladies and gents, it's been split. The targets for supply development is now 2% net profit after tax. For enterprise development, it's 1% net profit after tax. So you'll agree with me that where is the focus? Supply development. And not only is it now a case that it has doubled the percentage for supply development as it is for enterprise development, ladies and gents, there's a 40% minimum threshold. If businesses do not spend at least 0.8% of their net profit after tax, they will be penalized. 
If they do not spend at least 0.4% of their net profit after tax on enterprise development, they will be penalized. Ladies and gents, especially when we have a look at the definition as to who qualifies as an enterprise development beneficiary or a supply development beneficiary, you will understand what I'm about to say. And that is businesses are freaking out because they don't have the right number, the right color of businesses to do enterprise development on, to do supply development on. Now, through the different workshops, I'm sure they'll tell you about it later, through the different workshops that we're gonna be hosting together with THUD, we're going to be ensuring that you guys, that small businesses, black or white, are able to be put in a position where you can go knocking on a donor's door, be attractive enough to that donor, and then be a place where they will 100% or as high a probability as possible want to engage with you from an enterprise development perspective or a supply development um, perspective. So the first point that they get um, measured on out of 10 points is how much money are we spending on supply development? Their target is 2% net profit after tax. Then how much money are they spending on enterprise development? And remember we said that it's more than the money. It can be money, but can it also be different things? They get a bonus point if they were doing enterprise development on you and they bring you into their supply chain. There's a point for them. So negotiate with them. It's in their benefit to not only keep you outside of their supply chain, but ladies and gents, to give you business, to bring you within their supply chain. The awesome thing as well is that there is a bonus point if they're able to show that as a result of them enterprise or supply developing you, they have created capacity in your business to grow businesses. Ladies and gents, if we are going to, as South Africa, deal with the unemployment challenges that we have in this country, it's not through the standard banks, it's not through the BMWs, it is through small businesses. You guys are the hub, you are the vibrance of our economy and that is where it is going to happen. Some key things with regards to supply and enterprise development further. The definition, <laughs> I'm sorry, brother man's eating. Okay, the definition as to who a beneficiary can be. You have to be an EME or a QSE, end of story. Currently, businesses can do enterprise development on generics, on entities that earn more than 50 million. They can develop them, but I'm sure that you'll agree with me. What does a 50 million rand business need development for? Well, governments recognize that the people that need development are the smaller businesses. So first of all, if you are an EME or a QSC, you qualify. But not only that, and this is the bigger thing where businesses are freaking out, you have to be at least 51% black owned. Hello. Now, is that not opportunity for us? It is absolutely. That is why I'm telling you that businesses are freaking out. They're like, oh my gosh, where are we going to find these guys? Because a lot of businesses where they have done empowerment deals stopped at 50%. Or maybe they went 50 plus one, 50 plus two. We'll give you a little bit extra, plus three. All right, but they're not at 51%. So now they're freaking out as to where are we going to find these 51% black owned businesses? Okay, white people, do you leave the room? No, stay. All right, there's room for you, there's place for you, if not in the 49% that's there in the conversation of transformation. And you'll see as well that if you're an EME or a QSE, irrespective of the color of your business, you still are important. Okay, but the focus here, ladies and gents, 51% black owned. Now, I say overall NB. If we could create this company that was the model of all companies, that you could go to any business and pretty much knock on their door and they would love you because you provide so much opportunity for them. You would be an EME that is at least 51% black owned and of that 51% black ownership, there is 30% women. If you want to get something done, make sure the women are a part of it, okay? Now, you'll see why I emphasize the fact that there has to be, if you want to be optimal, 30% black women owned. It doesn't mean, of course, all right, that if you don't have any women that you, it won't work, it will. But if you want to be the best, the absolute optimal place for businesses, have some women in you, all right? Then, a new concept that's also been brought in, which I think is an absolutely brilliant thing, is that not only can they and should they develop you? But there needs to be a plan. 
This plan is going to force companies, going to force donors to sit down with you and say, what do you need? How do you need it? Versus just saying, well, if you want to come to me and ask me for money, you're going to do what I say. You're going to take what I want you to take. Because we may have varying needs. So this plan that they need to have with you needs to be negotiated. And it needs to have clear objectives. Why are you in this relationship? Ladies and gents, again, we're looking at your sustainability, increasing your capacity, which is in turn going to create jobs in South Africa, which is in turn going to help us transform. There needs to be priority interventions. There needs to be key performance indicators. No longer is it just going to be a case of we're going to give you something and you can go away. Businesses are now going to be like, what have you got to offer me? Why should our enterprise develop you? We're going to then have a partnership for, heaven, for, for however much long. And over that period of time, we want you to perform in different ways. And I personally think that that is great. Because there also needs to be responsibility on us ownership on us to do something. Because let it not be that in 10 years' time they say that we develop black businesses because we said how it's going to be done. It's going to be, no, you developed businesses within South Africa because we collaborated together, we worked together. There also needs to be a concise implementation plan, clearly articulated milestones, and there is a benefit if they have a minimum three-year contract with you. Long-term, sustainability. So you want to ensure that as you get your stuff together, that you are attractive enough for them to want to develop you. And not only develop you, ladies and gents, but give you business. Now, I said that businesses are freaking out. They are freaking out. First of all, where are they going to find these small black-owned businesses? But secondly, where are they going to find these small black-owned businesses that can deliver the quality, the quantity, and everything else from a values perspective of that business that they want? Just because we are black and we got some women in us and we're looking fine doesn't mean that we're going to get the money. It's expensive for them. So they're going to say, okay, what is in it for us? Why should we invest in you? There's going to be a limited opportunity if your act is not together with regards to your finances, if your act is not together with regards to your books, if your act is not together with regards to compliance, if your act is not together even with regards to your own BE certificate as well as um, any other proof that you need. Just to rock up and be like, I'm black, can you not see? It's not going to be good enough. So there needs to be steps that are taken so you can show how serious you are with regards to why you want them to develop you. Preferential procurement, which is also part of the scorecard. Ladies and gents, if we're going to think about the journey, the long-term journey, planning, all right, we start off enterprise development, okay? We're not in their supply chain. They're developing us. Then we graduate into supply development. Now we're guaranteed business. They're giving us business. It is important as well for them to give you business because out of 25 points, ladies and gents, you feature on all the different elements. Remember, enterprise and supply development, Biggest pillar, 40 points. If they don't get 40% minimum of these 25 points, what happens? They get penalized. Top line, you fall in there as an EME or QSC. If they spend money with you, it contributes to their target. QSCs, there's a specific target for you. At this present moment in time, QSC, EME, they didn't have to care how many QSCs they had as suppliers? How many EMEs they had as suppliers going forward? It matters. There's a particular line item for QSCs. There's a particular line item for EMEs. This has got nothing to do with your blackness. So even as you're as lily white as they come, you are still important. They recognize the fact that we need small businesses. So there's your opportunity to shine. If you're an EME, there's your opportunity to shine. And then if you're black, not only can you shine there and there, if you're an EME, but you also shine here. Why? Procurement from suppliers that are at least 51% black owned. 40% ladies and gents of their spend needs to be on 51% black owned businesses. They're freaking out. Where are these businesses? And then not only does 51% need to be on black owned businesses, but 30% needs to be on black woman owned businesses. That is why I said that if you are, want to be the absolute brilliant company with regards to attractiveness, you want to be a 51% black-owned business that has got 30% woman own ownership, and that's an EME. And why do I say so? So, if you are a black-owned business, you fall in there. You count. If you're an EME, you fall in there. You count. Why does Olga say 
Why do I say EME versus QEC? Look at the targets, higher. More points for EME than for QECs. Okay? So you fall in there, and you fall in there. You're 51% black owned, you fall in there. And 30% black owned, you fall in there. Ladies and gents, they need you. You speak to all the particular pillars and all the particular sub-criteria of this particular pillar. Now, in winding down, will they consider you as a question? You look it, you can speak the talk, but are you good enough? When I say good enough, can they trust you? Can they trust you with their business? Can they trust you with the opportunities? Or is it just going to be a perpetuity of you give us the money and we run away and we do nothing? But even if it is a case of you don't really care as to this relationship with a particular sponsor, a particular donor, the challenge that I have for you is may you care for the sake of this country. Can they please consider you for the sake of this country? Lastly, the future of our country is a period I thought a couple of years ago summarized this quite well. Children say, what do you want to be when you grow up? And they're like, we want to be alive. We want to be alive. We want to have an opportunity. We want to have a job. Ladies and gents, BE presents itself awesome opportunities to do stuff. Awesome opportunities to get rich. I don't know about you, but I want to be wealthy. I do. I ain't going to lie. I want to be wealthy. But then the question is, what am I going to do with that wealth? What are you going to do with that wealth? Be another black diamond? Walk around the place. You got all that swag and you think you're everything and a bag of chips and God's, God's gift to women? Yeah. Or those of us women, we're able to afford it and we're just prancing around with 5,000 rand weaves in our hair. You want to do it, do it fine. But in addition to your 5,000 rand weave, now that you've paid so much for it, you can't even afford to take your sister's children to school. You're so busy drinking Johnny Black at every single event that you go to, you forget that your own brother doesn't have school shoes. And we're <laughs> hanging out with Ben <laughs> All right, so ladies and gents, I saw this tagline, or rather this hashtag, on Thub's website, website and Facebook page, and I thought it was awesome. Advancing SA, that's what we should be doing. Get to where you can be. South Africa needs you. Your economy needs you. You've seen some examples as to how. Get to a place where you fully understand it, where you converse with us, so that we can advance um, South Africa. Find opportunities to mentorship. Reach back. What are you doing so that the children behind you, so that your sister's friends in the streets, when you go home in the township, they go like, we want to be like her. When I step out of my car, wherever I want to go, for young people, I want them to look at me and be like, you know what? I want to be like her. South Africa is able to produce, and it takes hard work. But can I tell you something? That's the one thing that I appreciate and respect about you guys as entrepreneurs. Tenacity, bravery, a little bit of madness, but you need that. So step up, ladies and gents, is my challenge to you. Step up and mentor. Step up and be an example. Step up and reach back. Create hope. Partner up with that. I mean, they're creating an awesome platform for you guys to be empowered. For all South Africans on a business front, particularly small businesses, to be empowered. So the world of BE awaits. The world of enterprise development awaits. The world of supplier development awaits. But more importantly, the world of transformation awaits. And you are able to contribute that. I am done.